Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This is a presentation to discuss the direct appropriations in session law 2023-134 for water and wastewater projects. Hopefully you all can hear me. Um, let us know in the chat if there's any technical issues. My name is Shadi Eskaf. I'm the director of the Division of Water Infrastructure in the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, per session law, uh, DEQ is administering the funds that we're talking about and will be working with you to assist you with the process. We invited every local government that has a direct appropriation in session law 2023-134 to attend this webinar. We're also recording it and we'll be posting it online. Hopefully everything works out smoothly. Uh, I'm grateful to be joined by my colleagues here from DEQ, uh, who will be co-presenting and answering questions today. As you may already be aware, the Division of Water Infrastructure provides low interest loans and grants for water, wastewater, and stormwater infrastructure projects uh, through multiple federal and state funding sources. And these funds are being administered through similar uh, processes as well. This webinar is an opportunity for recipients of the uh, direct appropriations to learn about how we are administering the funds and what's needed, how the funds will be dispersed, and so on. There'll be a short presentation at first to cover some of the items. Um, we'll see the cover, cover the items that you see listed here on the slide. And then afterwards, uh, we will be taking uh, questions from the audience. We want to reserve quite a bit of time for your questions so we can answer your questions. We'll discuss uh, the funds, eligibilities, next steps, and what happens in, a process, in the process for a funded project. We are recording this again, uh, this webinar, and posting it. We will also be posting the PowerPoint slides. You'll see some links um, and QR codes in these PowerPoint slides. So if you're looking for those later on, just know that you'll be able to find them on our website, and I'll show you where to find them uh, after this, um, after this uh, slide here. Please go ahead and post your questions. And we'll try our best to answer all or as many of them as possible before 2.30. Uh, we'll likely address a lot of the questions um, during the presentation as part of the presentation. So you may choose to wait until towards the end to pose your questions, or you can pose them at any time, uh, but we're not going to respond to the questions until the end of the presentation. So we're gonna cover what we hope to be the, the most common questions and, and just general process, um, after which we'll, we'll look at your questions and try to respond to as many of them as possible. Once the webinar has been recorded and posted online and these PowerPoint slides have been posted, which should be uh, this week, uh, please feel free to share the, the links and the information with your colleagues and consultants as you see fit. To be posted online, uh, but the PowerPoint slides should be going out this week. Um, and uh, hopefully, we can get your questions. We have a web page dedicated to the session law 2023 134 directive projects. Uh, and that web page has information, contact information available for you. Uh, the recording will be posted on that web page. Um, so you can see it, you can see the link to our division's website at the top here. Uh, and the QR codes takes you directly to the, um, what we're calling the 2023 Appropriations Act Directed Projects web page. Uh, to get to the web page, you can go to the Division of Water Infrastructure's web page first, which you can search for and navigate um, using Google or Bing, um, or go to DEQ's website, deq.nc.gov and then uh, navigate to divisions, division water infrastructure, and you'll get to our website. From there, you can scroll down until you see that, that blue box that you see on the left um, showing 2023 appropriations directed on projects. Um, or you can just use a QR code and go straight to that web page. Uh, just to give you some context, in case you are not already aware, um, the the Division of Water Infrastructure administers water, wastewater, and stormwater infrastructure funding programs. We administer them um, through multiple funding, uh, through multiple funding programs, 
We get state appropriations uh, as well as federal funds uh, administer all of those um, in those funding programs that you see here. I'm only going to be talking about, or we're only going to be talking about the session law 2023-134 direct appropriations in today's webinar. If you have questions about other funding programs, we could entertain them, but the, the focus, the primary focus is really on the session law uh, direct appropriations. Having said that, I will start off also by saying we have other funds available. So if you are looking for more funds, we do take applications twice a year for low interest loans or grants. Um, and I'll mention that towards the end of the presentation before we take questions as well. So what's in Session Law 2023-134? And just to shorten it, I don't have to keep repeating uh, Session Law 2023-134 every single time. I might just call them direct appropriations or the 134 projects, uh, but we're talking about the same thing throughout this webinar. Uh, the appropriation uh, uh, was enacted last year in October, uh, and that was the Appropriations Act of 2023, the Biennium 2023-2025 um, State Budget um, Appropriations Act. The session law appropriates $2 billion in, in that biennium from the drinking water reserve and the wastewater reserve to DEQ for various water, wastewater, and stormwater funding, including $1.97 billion in directed projects, which is what we're talking about here. You can see a quote from the session law itself that the funds are being administered to the drinking water reserve and the wastewater reserve to provide projects, construction grants, or public water systems and wastewater systems as provided in the section of the session, of the session law. That's important language because it means that the funds are being um, channeled through the reserves and North Carolina General Statute 159G de defines what's eligible uh, for funding through these reserves. It also mentions construction projects. So we're expecting to see construction or construction related um, projects such as planning and design. Um, the funds have to be eligible according to, um, to what's in session law and in that general statute as well. There are a couple of exceptions to uh, North Carolina General Statute 159G. Um, in the session law, in session law 2023-134, uh, it removed a couple of things that normally would come along with grants funded out of those two reserves. First of all, there's no limit to the reserve grants. If you're familiar with our state reserve program, um, you might know that we have a three, statutory $3 million uh, cap on the grants that could be funded out of the reserves. That cap does not apply to the direct appropriations. Some of the direct appropriations exceed $3 million and that's totally fine. There's also no grant fee that's going to be charged to these funds. Um, normally there'll be a grant fee for all state reserve programs, but the grant fees are, have been uh, removed with this session law. The session law also uh, specifies that unneeded funds from the direct appropriations will be reverted back to DEQ for other water and sewer infrastructure projects. Now, our goal is to make sure that you all receive all your funds and spend it all for water and wastewater projects. We know that there's enough demand out there for everybody um, to use your funds. Uh, and we're, we're trying to make sure that you, uh, you have access to it all. The session law also says that DEQ may, uh, may use 3% of the funds to be allocated for DEQ's administrative costs. And that is what we're doing. So 3% of the funds, 3% of the direct appropriations will be used for DEQ's administrative costs to administer all these funds. Um, and that leaves the local governments with 97% um, of the direct appropriation. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The session law um, under section 12.2.E specified or has specified $1.937 billion for direct appropriation to 201 local governments. Uh, this um, uh, Appropriations Act, the 2023 Appropriations Act, became law on October 3rd. The division has contacted all of the local governments, all 201 local governments, by email on October 17th with a form called a Request for Funding Form uh, to initiate the projects. I'll talk about the Request for Funding Form in a minute, as well as if you haven't received it or if you're expecting it or you're the person from the local government that should receive it and it might have gone to somebody else. We'll talk about some of those uh, later on, but I just wanted to um, 
let you all know that we had reached out or we attempted to reach out to every local government that has a direct appropriation on October 17th. Um, and you may find an email buried somewhere in there with that information, but we'll, we're happy to follow up and make sure that you see it again. At the moment, we're collecting information from the local governments about the projects, um, which includes what the project you know, description is, uh, what the budget is going to be for the project, as well as the contact information from the local government, who is the authorized representative, uh, so that we can uh, know who we will be interacting with from the local government with these directed projects. And we try to get that information as quickly as possible so that we can initiate the projects for you. So that would be the, the first step. On eligibilities, uh, there are two things to keep in mind with eligibilities. First of all, in the session law, some of the direct appropriations actually specify what the project, what the funds will be used for. Uh, so here are just some screenshots of five examples where uh, the, uh, the appropriation itself mentions that a certain amount will be used for a very specific purpose. Uh, as long as there's a specific purpose in there, uh, all activities that are related to that specific purpose will be uh, is eligible, but you can only use that portion of the funding for that specified project according to the to the session law. For those that have funds appropriated, but not with a specific project mentioned in the session law, the eligibilities are determined by the drinking water reserve and wastewater reserve eligibilities, which is in North Carolina General Statute 159G. I know there's a lot of text on this slide. This is actually a screenshot of, a, of the first page of the request for funding form that every local government is receiving. So this information is provided to you all as well. It's also on our website. Uh, what it shows here is that in North Carolina General Statute 159G defines eligibilities for these funds to be drinking water projects, wastewater projects for planning, design, and construction of, of those projects. So you can see that there's language in here about uh, construction costs for public water system, wastewater collection system, wastewater treatment works projects, and or stormwater quality projects. Uh, construction costs are uh, defined in that statute, as you see here. It's, it's basically anything related to planning, design, or constructing those, those projects. And then there's some explanations of those cost eligibilities as well in terms of um, uh, capacity growth. Uh, so if you want to use these funds to expand your system in some way, uh, there's a limit to the, uh, the amount that you can expand using um, state grants. Uh, and that's uh, shown here in the first 1CA. Legal fees, fiscal administrative uh, contingency costs, uh, the permit fees. Uh, when you're when you're doing construction and you're getting your permits, you can use the funds to pay for the permit fees as well. Uh, and the cost to acquire real property related to that project is also an eligible uh, expense. This is what determines eligibility for funding. Um, I want to take a second here to mention, you know, we know that some of the local governments have funding from us from either. ARPA or state revolving funds or CDBG, and maybe choosing to add some of this money, some of the session law money to that existing project. If you do so, that's absolutely fine. But if you do so, just please be aware that all the federal and state conditions that apply to the existing project will also then apply to the funds that you add from the direct appropriations. Because as soon as you have an SRF project or an ARPA project, if you keep adding money to that project, the ARPA uh, requirements and the SRF requirements will also apply to the new funds that you're adding to that existing project. So I want to make that um, clear up front. And if you have questions, please let, let us know. The general process for a funded project is what you see here. These are the um, more like the, the, the big phases of a project. And this is assuming um, that we're doing that you have a project that you want to start um, and you haven't, been, you haven't, you're not already in the stage where you're constructing, you're in the stage of designing that project. So a typical project would look as follows. First, we need to initiate the project, which means that we need to know what information, um, you know, who, who are contacting, what a, a general project description. Uh, then you, as a local government, then you move into um, a pre-construction planning and design phase. Uh, so that includes working with your engineers to design your project, to create your plans and specifications, um, 
and to submit them for approvals, to apply for your permits and receive your permits. Uh, have all of that done before you get to a point where you can bid your project. You then go into bidding and hopefully you get enough bids coming in um, and you can then um, seek to award uh, one, uh, one of those bids uh, and execute a construction con um, contract. Then you go into construction and construction can, um, you know, you, you, and then we'd be inspecting construction. We'll talk about each of these phases um, in this presentation with some additional information about all of them. Our division, our staff here at DEQ are here to help you with each one of those steps. Uh, so we, when we initiate the project, we will put you on the timeline. We'll assign a project manager um, to help you navigate these steps to make sure that we move, uh, move along uh, together to get to a uh, conclusion for the project as well. I'll, I'll mention here too that we, if you're familiar with our funding programs, sometimes there's environmental reviews and engineering reports. Uh, for these funds, there's not going to be an environmental review or engineering report unless you're adding funding to an existing project that already requires them, in which case we'll need to do those. Um, and there's also going to be engineering reports required for a small number of projects, which I'll mention in, in a minute. But first, before we go into the, you know, what happens with the project, let's talk about initiating a project. So step one, um, and again, October 17th, we sent a request for funding form to all the local governments. We asked you all to complete this form so that we have the information here at DEQ to be able to initiate the project and um, to, communicate, to, to communicate with you, to assign the project to a project manager and to communicate with you the next steps. Uh, so if you have not yet already filled out the request for funding form, please do so. Um, and uh, provide that, pro we're looking for project information, just a general description of what you're planning to do. It's not really a detailed uh, project description, but enough to show that it's a project that meets the statutory requirements in terms of, um, it's a drinking water project or a wastewater project. Um, provide a general budget um, for the project. Again, it doesn't have to be extremely detailed. Um, and identify um, if you're using any other funding sources for the same project as well. Uh, and name an authorized representative from the local government. That is the person that we'll be dealing with directly for the specific project. Once you have the form completed, uh, you would then submit it online to DEQ um, using, the, the, the link is provided in the request for funding form itself. I'm showing it to you here on the slide as well. Keep in mind project eligibilities uh, when you're selecting a project, uh, and we'll go into some of the, you know, how do you select a big project. Um, while you're filling the uh, request for funding form, we have an Appendix A, which lists all of the direct appropriations and whether or not that direct appropriation has a specific project identified in the session law and how much is available for that local government for that direct appropriation. So a couple of tips here is, um, First of all, use the line in the request for funding form in Appendix A, we're giving you a line number. Uh, that's what we're calling it in the first column. Please use that in the request for funding so we can match your request to the specific set of all line item number. Um, so look for that item number and put it in your request for funding. Uh, the second thing to check is to see whether or not that direct appropriation in the session law already has a project specified. Because if it does, then that is the project that you have to describe, and we cannot provide you the funds for anything else. If the session law is specific to a project, it has to be for that project, so please make sure that you're um, defining that project. The last thing is uh, make sure that when you're requesting the funds and you're putting your budget together, you're showing the budget and the amount that you're requesting from what's eligible or what's available to the recipients for projects. So I mentioned that the appropriations has a direct appropriation and then 3% is going towards administrative costs of DEQ. So that second column, the one that says funds available to recipient for projects is what's available for you to use for your project. So please budget for that and report that number. Uh, another tip is to, well, first of all, we wanna make sure that you get all of the funding uh, that's available to you. So please um, design a project with a budget that claims the full funds. Um, try not to send a budget that leaves behind a, a small portion. We've had some experiences in the past where um, a local government might have a million dollars of appropriations that's available to them, and they're requesting 999,000, leaving a you know a thousand left. 
we prefer that you ask with a full amount. Uh, the second tip is to try to not break up the projects as much as possible. If you can have one, if you're, if you're planning to use all of your funds for a drinking water project, try to design a project that is that will use up the entire amount. Um, and that could be various activities. Now, you may need to break up your request for funding. You might have an appropriation that you need to split up into a drinking water project and a wastewater project. If you are doing a drinking water and a wastewater, we do need two separate requests for funding uh, because we administer them through different reserves. And then if you have also a drinking water project or multiple drinking water projects that have significantly different timelines, there's, you know, there's a project that you were planning to do that's going to be implemented next year and another project that needs another three more years before, the, before you get to construction, you might want to separate those out. But those are really the only, um, we're hoping that we don't see a lot of um, breaking up of the earmarks into multiple projects as much as possible, try to keep them all together so it's easier for you to administer because then you can move funds uh, for all the activities within that one big project. If you have questions about the request for funding form, our contact person is Mikhail Wilmer. Um, and you can see her email address and her phone number listed here. Now, um, I'll pause here and mention that when we sent the request for funding forms out on October 17th, we had listed on that form two contact persons, uh, Mikhail Wilmer and Austin. Uh, Austin, unfortunately, has left the department um, since then. So uh, really all questions, if you're trying to reach Austin, you're not gonna be able to reach him. Uh, please send all questions about the request for funding form to Mikhail Wilmer. If you haven't seen a request for funding form for the local government, for your local government, um, you can reach out to Mikhail and ask for, ask for another copy. Um, or you can look through uh, the emails that came on October 17th. I've, I have heard personally from local government that the email went, unfortunately, to their spam folder. Um, so check your inboxes, um, check the spam folders. We've tried to target uh, mayors, town county managers, or the town administrators, um, at least one contact for every local government. Uh, or if we had been working already with a local government uh, with an authorized rep for an existing project. So maybe you uh, have an ARPA project with us and the utilities director is the authorized rep. Well, we've, we were then sending this request for funding form to that authorized rep. Um, so you might want to check and see if there's, you know, if you already have a project with us, it might be the same person who's already interacting with our division on the department for funded projects. But those are, the, those are the folks that we were trying to send the request for funding form to. And, and sometimes we get questions from local government saying, I haven't seen this request for funding form. It's because it went to a different person in the local government. And um, feel free to reach out to us and we can send you a, a, a copy if somebody else from the local government needs that copy. Uh, as of today, I think we've received um, re completed requests for funding forms from about 61 local governments out of the 201. Uh, others we know are working on it, and others may not have seen it because it's gone to somebody else, and we you know, just need to send it to the right person. So we appreciate your help in identifying who should be getting this request so that you can send it in to us and we can initiate a project as quickly as possible. After we get the request for funding form, what happens then? Well, next from DEQ, from our side, is that we will issue uh, what we call a letter of intent to fund, which is a letter um, notifying, officially notifying the local government uh, that you know, these funds are, are now for that project. We'll identify a project number that you'll use for communications with us. We identify the DEQ project manager that you need to be interacting with, as well as other relevant information. And that letter of intent to fund also includes a milestones timeline. That timeline typically puts uh, typically puts you, if you have not already done design and planning for the project, we would create a timeline that provides almost, uh, you know, a, around a year to submit plans and specifications to the department for review. And it takes about 20 months total from the start, uh, 20 months to get the project uh, to be ready for bid. So we know typically that, in, that infrastructure projects and structure projects that still need planning and design take about two years uh, to get to the point where you're ready to go out to bid and to execute construction contracts. So the timeline is going to be there and we try to hold all the projects to that milestones timeline. Uh, after the letter of intent to fund, we also send you a funding offer that specifies the funding amounts and whether the funds are being used or added to other existing projects. 
as well as any conditions and assurances that are coming with these funds. We require uh, the, your governing board to adopt a resolution to accept the funding offer with the conditions and assurances. And we need that executed funding offer returned to the division before we can do any disbursements of the funds. That's a state requirement. So be on the lookout for that additionally. And that usually comes soon after the letter of intent to fund for these types of projects. If you're looking to start, and you know we're working on this paperwork right now, we don't want you to have to wait on the paperwork. Just here are a couple of things to keep in mind too that you can get started on. Procurement for engineering. Um, you need to follow the state law when it comes to procurement. So North Carolina General Statute 143-64, Article 3D, uh, procurement for architectural engineering and surveying services. Do you know that article does apply to these funds? So you have to procure engineering services uh, using what's called the Mini Brooks Act. Um, and you can start doing that now. You don't really have to wait. Looking to my colleagues, see, yeah, I'm seeing Mao, you know, guys, you don't really have to wait for the letter of intent to fund, just knowing that you've got the funds um, and you're identifying what you're using the funds for. I would suggest send a request for funding form and then start thinking about the procurement if you haven't already procured your engineering firm. If you're familiar with our funding programs, you might be asking, you know, what about the engineering report? Are we going to do an engineering report? For most of our funding programs, before we do plans and specifications, we require an engineering report to be submitted to the division. For these funds, engineering reports will not be needed, except for two, two situations, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. First, if you're adding these funds to an existing project that already requires an engineering report or an environmental review, those will still be required for these funds. The second time, the second uh, scenario where an uh, engineering report will be needed is if the local government is designated as distressed by the State Water Infrastructure Authority and the Local Government Commission, and the funds that are being requested or that are uh, directly appropriated are uh, primarily for a construction project that's neither specified in the session law, so the session law doesn't say you're going to use the funds for a specific purpose, um, and it's not a rehab and replacement project, then we'll need an engineering report but some of the elements of the engineering report will be waived. The majority of the projects will go straight into plans and specifications review without needing an engineering report. We'll be communicating with those that might need engineering report, especially for that second, uh, that second bullet point there. Uh, if you have questions about that, please ask in the chat. Uh, if, you're, if you're a local government designated distressed, um, we, can answer, uh, we can answer a little bit more about the engineering report requirements there. I'm going to pass the uh, mic over to uh, my colleague, Kavitha Abigadevi, who is the section chief, to explain um, the rest of the process. And um, I'll come back and talk about disbursements. Kavitha. Thank you, Shadi. Uh, good afternoon. Kavitha Abigadevi, section chief of Division of Water Infrastructure. Uh, so we'll discuss the next step. So once for most of the projects, as Shadi said, if this engineering report is not required, we will move directly to the plans and specifications summit and review. So when you're preparing plans and specs for the project, please go to the DWIS webpage and click on the I have funding section. So there you can follow the requirements for state programs. So please know that if your project is not co-funded with federal funds, that is SRO funds, you just have to follow the state program requirements. You don't need to follow SRO conditions. And these projects must also obtain permits and authority to construct from the permitting agencies. DWI reviews for eligibility of individual items in the big form. In general, all costs associated with planning, design, and construction directly related to water or sewer projects are eligible. And some examples of ineligible expenses include uh, paving of roadways more than the ex ex excavated area, spare parts, service contracts, maintenance contracts, and extended warranties. 
So we, in general, like, you know, we can pay for all the costs related to planning, design, and construction. So if, if that just requires, like, if you, have, if you require land purchase, that also should be directly related to the project. We will also review for one of the special conditions that's a state requirement, that's MDEWB. So you will have that, what you need to do for that in our website, as mentioned before. And we will also have a drought bill certification of, if applicable. So only if you're doing like a waterline extension or expansion projects that you will be subject to drought bill. In that situation, you, your project manager will contact you and let you know that you need to have the drought bill certification signed and submitted to us. So don't worry about it right now. <clears throat> So once you have your plans and specs approved by the WI and the permits are issued, um, you can go for bidding. Generally, um, since the sort of conditions not apply, uh, not applicable to this project, we tell follow the state procurement laws for bidding and procurement. So I find this procurement manual um, by NC Department of Administration very useful. So if you are not familiar with state procurement laws and bidding requirements, you can um, um, follow this manual and then the link is also provided in our um, uh, presentation here, which will be available later. So once you have selected your um, low bidder or low responsive responsible bidder, you, the next step is coming to us and requesting authority to award. So certain documentations are required um, to be submitted to receive an ATA. Those include project bid information signed by the authorized representative, bid tabulation seen by the consulting engineer, proposals of the successful builders, tentative award of res award, resolution from the funding recipient, engineer's recommendation, and proof of advertisement. You will also be including all MBE, WBE, um, good faith effort documentation that you used for the bidding process. Uh, once we review this uh, required documents, DW will issue authority to award. At that point, you can move on to executing the contract with the uh, recommended bidder. So uh, at this time, you will have an assigned inspector from Division of Water Infrastructure. So please invite the inspector for pre-construction meeting. In general, DWI inspector will conduct a minimum of three on-site inspections to make sure that the money is spent um, as approved by our division and also by the permitting agency. You will also work with the inspector if any change orders are needed for the successful completion of this project. With that, I will pass this on to Shadi again Thank to you. talk about disbursement. Thank you so much. All right, so disbursements, how can you get access to the funds? Um, disbursements, so I'd say disbursements, I mean when DEQ sends the funds to the local governments so that you can use it for the costs. Disbursements are based on eligible and allowable costs incurred for the documented project or documented change to the project. Uh, what does that mean? That means that we, we don't disperse these funds up front. We don't give you the appropriation up front for you to spend. You incur the cost. You're doing the work. You're doing the, the, the design, the plan and design. And as you're incurring those costs, you're sending the invoices to DEQ, and we will disperse based on those documented costs that are related to the project. You can request disbursements prior to paying contractors. Um, you, have, you, have the, you have both options, of course, but if you receive from your contractors an invoice, you can always send those invoices to DEQ to receive disbursement from us, and then you would have three business days to pay your contractors uh, with these funds. Uh, you can also, if you choose, pay contractors first and then request disbursement of the funds later on. Either way, you're documenting the costs that you've incurred, and you're sending that to DEQ, and we're reviewing it to make sure that it's part of the project. So you're providing that uh, additional information or the, sub, the, the invoices um, that would match up with 
the documentation for the project uh, that has been approved. Prior to any disbursements, um, DEQ must receive all of the required documentation um, that we, we will notify you of. So, for example, I mentioned at the very beginning that we send a funding offer to the local government and we need the governing boards to pass a resolution accepting the funding offer and the conditions and to execute that funding offer. We can't disperse the funds until we receive that document. And that's one of a few documents that we would need. Um, so we're communicating with you that, or we will be communicating with you what documentation we need at what time. And we need those documentations before disbursements can begin. Up to 15% of the funding amount that's available for the project can be dispersed for costs incurred prior to getting to construction. So as you're doing planning and design, or as you're applying for permit fees, you can submit for disbursement requests along the way uh, for about, up to about 15%. But since the funds need to be used for construction, if you have a construction project, the rest of the funds are available for after construction begins, which could also still include planning, design costs, permit fees, and construction costs as well. All this is explained in that request for funding form. So when you, when you see it, I think it's on the first page, it might be on the second page, but it explains the 15%. Um, when you're submitting, so how do you request disbursements? We have a disbursement request form uh, that's gonna be shared with the local governments when we send the funding offer. And you'd submit that disbursement request form with the documentation, meaning invoices, um, showing that the, the invoices that you're, you're submitting are for cost incurred for the documented project, um, according to the bid, ta uh, bid tabulation form, for instance, or other um, related documentation showing that it's part of the project. So we're nearing the end of the presentation, um, but before we go into questions, just wanted to bring up that, um, you know, there, there's some additional considerations and opportunities. This is, um, we're very grateful uh, for the General Assembly legislators for providing $2 billion uh, for water, wastewater uh, infrastructure projects across the state. That is on top of uh, the funds that have already been appropriated uh, through ARPA, um, and the federal funds have also been provided. So we have a lot of funding uh, right now in North Carolina uh, for infrastructure projects, and it is all, um, it's all needed. We actually need even more than that, than, than what's been appropriated. So we're, we're very thankful and grateful for the opportunity. Uh, it creates a lot of opportunities for, for you as local governments with um, use of the funds. Um, many of you already know what you wanna use the funds for, and that's fantastic. Um, so we can we can move on those quickly. For those of you that are developing projects or developing plans, we have some ideas and considerations. Um, one thing for everybody to know is that again, construction projects, especially if you're starting from the beginning where you're still doing planning and design, can take four to five years uh, to get to completion. It takes about a couple of years to do the planning and design. Um, and then another at least couple of years for, for construction, depending on how complicated or how um, involved in the construction project is. Uh, of course, if you've already done the planning and design and you're nearing construction, then that shortens that time frame. Um, keep in mind that this is funding that's being provided by grant funds. And what we've learned in, in the past, uh, not recent past only, but in, in his, uh, historically, when grant funds have been used for infrastructure projects, unless the, the recipients, the local governments, are also planning for the long-term uh, capital cost to replace and rehab those assets, uh, it becomes very expensive later on. So infrastructure that gets uh, put into place because grant funds were made available, but the local government then does not plan for um, adding or pre preparing revenues to cover the uh, replacement costs of that asset 20 years down the line, 30 years down the line when that asset needs to be replaced. It becomes very, very challenging and it puts the local governments in a very difficult situation. So one of my, my my advice, my personal advice, is to consider the what you know what the grant funding is a great opportunity to cover the capital cost right now. But the but as a local government, you should be thinking about the depreciation of that asset and how you're going to be able to pay for that replacement because there's no guarantee that 20 years from from now there will be more grant funding to replace those assets. So great opportunity for for right now. It's fantastic. We need it. Um, 
but plan for the future as well when you receive these funds. These may affect your rates, for instance, should you be adjusting your rates to generate the revenues you need to be able to plan for the long-term management um, and, and um, uh, asset management of, of the assets you're putting in with grants. The other question to consider is, you know, what can be funded using other means? Um, you've got a limited amount in your direct appropriation. Um, prioritize the, where you need the funds the most. If you have other opportunities where you can use other funds to do other projects, then maybe, you know, just think about what, where, you, what's the best, what's the most impact, um, most impact you can do with this direct appropriation. I think that's the best way of trying to explain uh, what we're trying to show here. What about ARPA? Um, so there are direct appropriations with ARPA, so I want to bring this one up uh, to make sure that we're clarifying differences between Session Law 2023-134 direct appropriations and ARPA. ARPA funds must be expended by December 31, 2026. That's a federal requirement. Many of you have ARPA funds from us. Keep in mind, if you do not use your ARPA funds, if you don't expend your ARPA funds, by December 31, 2026, 2026 you, lo you lose those funds. Those funds go back to the federal government. That's a federal requirement. We, we cannot change that. We cannot give you extensions on ARPA. Session Law 2023-134 funds are not ARPA and don't have that December 31, 2026 expenditure deadline, which is great. If you're managing, so we know that many of you already have ARPA projects with us, and now we have these additional direct appropriations. Our advice is this. If you are managing an ARPA project, as well as these funds, please prioritize the ARPA project to ensure that you're using your ARPA funds before that federal expenditure deadline. If you had to you know, direct your, your consultants to focus on between an ARPA project and this new direct appropriation, unless there's some extenuating circumstances, ARPA projects should be prioritized first so that you can make use of all the ARPA funds before you lose them. So how do you select a project? Again, if you already have an idea of a project, that's great. If the session law specifies a project for you, then, then that's uh, it's a moot point. If, however, you're, um, you've got this opportunity, you've got this funding, and now you're developing a project, coming up with an idea of what this project should be, we have some thoughts for you. Um, take a look at your most recent capital improvement plan, or if you have an asset management plan, look into those and look at the highest priority projects and see, see if that if the funding is available or the funding is, is enough to cover some of the projects that you have in your CIP or your asset management plan. We've just recently funded a lot of asset inventory and assessment studies, which basically creates an asset management plan for local governments. Um, if you're done with, with the asset inventory assessment or if you're getting close to that and you're developing your asset inventories um, and your uh, asset management plans, take a look at that final report uh, or even the draft report. It will list some projects that are being identified. This is where you're identifying assets that are aging that are critical for your system and that need replacement or rehabilitation. Well, if you've done the study already or even close to finishing that study, that's a great source of information where the, these funds should go. Similarly, if you're doing a, a merger regionalization feasibility study, where you're looking at the feasibility of interconnecting with another system, merging with another system, or some other way of partnership, or even a private-public partnership, or working with an investor-owned utility, those are things that are being studied in these MRF studies. Um, you might be able to find opportunities to fund what the recommendations are in those studies using direct appropriations. Another source of information Speak with your legislators. They may know what they were appropriating these funds specifically for. Uh, speak with your operators or utility managers. They know your assets. They know what, um, what your water system, what your wastewater system needs uh, urgently and, and most critically. So they'd be a great source of information for uh, prioritizing projects. And then for local governments that are designated as distressed, uh, we suggest you contact our division's viable utilities projects units. Um, this is a great opportunity. So you know as a local government that's designated as a stress, there are some statutory requirements to do a, an asset management plan, uh, a rate study, and to address the issues that make your system uh, potentially non-viable. There may be some infrastructure projects um, that, you know, there, there's aging infrastructure that needs to be addressed. 
this is a great opportunity to use these uh, these direct appropriations to implement projects that will address viability. And we can help you with that. Uh, our Viable Utilities Projects Unit can work with you one-on-one -on -one to take a look and see what, what might be good opportunities for this funding um, if your designated is distressed. Um, here are some types of these types of projects that you might want to consider. Replacing aging infrastructure, uh, addressing contamination or addressing PFAS. We know a lot of systems now are identifying that you've got PFAS and you're looking for either to do an evaluation or assessment study on how to address PFAS or even to go into construction uh, to treat PFAS. Um, so funds can be used for those. Any kind of regionalization project, interconnections, uh, partnerships, mergers, those types of projects are, of course, um, eligible for these funds. Uh, focusing on disadvantaged communities. Uh, this is an opportunity to use grant funding to, um, to provide service or to connect or to address issues that you find in disadvantaged communities. Um, uh, addressing resilience. Uh, if your assets are getting flooded every few years from, uh, from weather events, uh, could you use some of these funds to increase resilience of your infrastructure? Cybersecurity, uh, projects that will address water or energy loss, um, or not energy loss, but energy efficiency or water loss. Uh, if you're looking to do stream water quality projects, stream restoration, uh, stormwater environmental protection type projects. So if you're adding BMPs, for instance, um, or some kind of a, a stormwater project that would uh, protect the uh, stormwater quality, the stormwater runoff uh, quality, uh, that would be an, an option as well for these funds. Implementing asset management plans and CIPs, like I mentioned, and then you can also use these funds for project planning. So if you only have a small amount and you can't really implement a lot of construction with it, you might be looking to do an asset inventory assessment uh, or um, uh, pre-construction planning for a project that you plan to, to fund uh, some other way down the line as well. Um, essential system upgrades, right-sizing infrastructure. There's a lot of opportunities and lots of types of uh, infrastructure projects that you can do with this funding. And then again, if you're interested in even more funding than what's in the direct appropriations and what you might have already received from the division, we take applications twice a year uh, for low interest loans and for grants that we administer from multiple sources, state and federal sources. On our website, we have an I Need Funding webpage um, and the link is, is provided here uh, that provides the application materials and uh, uh, lets you know we have um, the application trainings as well. We're just about almost ready to go into spring 2024 application period. Uh, we'll be opening that up uh, towards the end of February. We'll have the application forms posted towards the end of this month. Applications will be due April 30th at five o'clock. We expect to have around $200 million in, in funding available for applications. And we're doing application trainings in five regions of the state uh, on those dates that you see listed here, February 27th through March 8th. We highly recommend whoever is going to be preparing an application to come to an application training um, at least once a year. Um, we recommend that we come every single time uh, that we do an application training, um, but um, attending at least once a year to know how our applications um, have you know, just recently added emerging contaminants and lead service lines, for instance, into our applications. Uh, if you're interested in application trainings, we have a registration um, on that webpage. You have, we have registration information. And application trainings are free. Uh, if you after this, so we're going to take questions. Um, but if you after this webinar, if you have follow up questions about session law twenty twenty three one thirty four uh, direct appropriations, who who do you go to? And here's a list of uh, contacts for you. If you have questions or if you want to reach out um, about the request for funding form, uh, contact Mikael Wilmer uh, at the email address you see listed here. If you have questions about projects. Uh, what might be eligible and what's not, or just questions about how to handle specific things about your drinking water, wastewater, or stormwater project. I'm uh, providing a list of contacts here. You, you've heard from Kavitha, she's the section chief, and then you've got David, Drupti, and Tony, who can also help you answer drinking water, wastewater, stormwater. For local governments designated as distressed, you can contact Kristen uh, for information about, uh, or if you're trying to select a project that might be helpful um, to address viability. And then media requests or information, just general public information um, uh, requests will go to our PIO, Kathy Ackroyd. And of course, you can always reach out to me as well, um, uh, Shadi Eska after the director. 
And with that, I think we are done with presentation, so we can open up for questions. Uh, I see that we've had some questions submitted in the chat. Um, I haven't had a chance to actually go through them, but we'll, we'll read them uh, going down from top to bottom and try to address them. Uh, the first question we see is, can we use the funding to pay for, less, for the less service line program? <clears throat> yeah, like you. Okay. <clears throat> yes, you can um, use the funding uh, for less service line program, but if you have other projects, we would recommend because we have uh, enough money in our less service line funding program. So we can make use of our funds, or if you don't want that, yes, you can use your funds to do the less service projects. Yeah, I, I would concur that we we do have a lot of lead service line. Um, we take applications for lead service line uh, identification and replacement throughout the year. So it's not a twice a year application, it's any time of the year. Um, and uh, we try to award those multiple multiple suite of meetings. Uh, we do have a lot of funding. There's a lot of principal forgiveness, which looks like a grant. Uh, and the loan portion is always at 0% interest. Uh, so we have a lot of funding for lead service line. As Kavitha said, if you can use a lead service line program to pay for lead service line projects and then use a direct appropriation for something else that might be more impactful. But, but you can use these funds to do a lead service uh, project. Okay, we have a, another question. Okay, I'm gonna have to read this one up. Uh, we're using local funds as a partial match in the contingency line item for the project. And if we do wind up with uh, expending contingency funds, how are the expenses allocated between directed funds and local funds? Or directed funds used first, then the local funds were equally distributed or proportionally or similar format. All right. All directed funds will be used first, so you can use your own funds like if needed, that should be fine. But usually when we write our authority to award, we put like about 5% of the current bid, bid amount as a contingency. So that's how we um, award our ATA. But if you think that, you know, that money is not enough to successfully complete that project, you can definitely use your funds and then request our funds first and then use your funds um, up once needed. Thank you, Kavitha. Question about how can one show that stormwater quantity elements in a project are needed for the primary purpose of stormwater quality? Okay. Um, if the direct appropriation uh, specifies that the, 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 um, that the funds are to be used for stormwater infrastructure projects, you can do stormwater construction. You know, that, that shouldn't be a problem. If the direct appropriation doesn't specify and you want to use the funds for a stormwater project, um, because the uh, North, the general statute 159G defines what's eligible under construction costs for these reserves uh, is for stormwater quality, not stormwater quantity. Uh, basically, we just need to see that there's some kind of a quant quality project uh, included. So if you can add some BMPs to a quantity project, or not quantity project, but to a in stormwater infrastructure project, that should be sufficient. So add in something that would address the stormwater quality to make that project eligible. Is there a time frame for obligating spending these funds? We talked about that, um, that these funds are not ARPA funds, so they don't have that December 2026 expenditure deadline. Um, these funds don't have the types of deadlines that we have with state revolving funds, with CDDG, with ARPA funds. Uh, so again, the um, we need to know, well, if you have multiple projects, and you've got projects that are being funded out of ARPA, funded out of CDBG, funded out of SRF, and then funded out of the direct appropriations. The ones that you would need to worry about the most in terms of expenditures and to make sure that we're moving quickly on those are ARPA, CDBG, and SRF. The direct appropriations have a little bit more leeway in terms of expenditures. Now, having said that, we definitely don't want to have these funds sitting for 10 years um, without being expended. Um, so we're gonna be working, you know, we're, we're putting milestones on the projects to make sure that there's progress and we'll be working with all the local governments to make sure that the funds are being spent. We do report on these funds every year uh, to, to the legislature. Um, so we wanna make sure that the funds are being spent. Please don't, um, yeah. So again, we're recommending and, and 
uh, advising folks to be focusing on ARPA if you have ARPA projects because of that hard federal deadline. Uh, SRF CDBG also has expenditure deadlines, uh, not quite as stringent as ARPA. And these funds are a little bit more flexible, which is great. If a project comes in under the funding limit, can we apply for the remaining funds to go towards additional water sewer projects? The answer is yes. If you have, um, you know, if, if, if there is any money left over, you can use it for any other project, provided that is allowable in that session law line item. Yeah, and, that's, and that session law does provide also um, funds that are unused will revert back to DEQ to be used for other water and sewer projects. Um, there's also language in that session law that says that, well, also the local government that had originally received that original direct appropriation um, can use the funds for planning projects or something else. So if a project comes in under your funding limit, uh, just let us know. We can work with you to make sure that you've got other projects lined up, as Kavitha said, so that we can use it. And one idea would be to have a change order so you are not stopping the project uh, and, you know, you don't have to then return the money, right? So the scope changes is allowed at the end for this type of money anytime. So you can issue a change order, add some more scope, similar scope, different scope into the project and still use your appropriation completely. That would be my, my recommendation. Um, this might be a question for you, Kavita. If a, if a project has been under design before session law 2023-134 funding was made available, can all the engineering design work be reimbursed without having to go through an engineering procurement process? Um, the, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, these projects, the session law projects, do not have to meet the ARPA procurement policy or Brooks Act. However, we hope that this project, the engineer is procured based on the mini Brooks Act or um, qualification-based selection. We did not ask for any uh, documentation to prove that. So um, if you come to us with the engineering cost associated with that project and we, you have the executed engineering agreement, and if all the documentation looks fine, yes, you can get uh, refunded for those expenses. Uh, question about the letter of intent to fund. So once the letter of intent to fund has been issued, can the project type, water or sewer, be changed? Uh, can the project location description also be changed? The answer is uh, yes, but you know <laughs> we don't want to deal with this because there's like you know 201 communities. Maybe we're talking about 300 projects. So if we keep changing projects on us already, like you know our resources are limited, as you know. Uh, it's going to, you know, cause a lot of hardships on us. But if it is um, the only option to move forward, yes, we will um, allow that. You can change the project. You just have to let us know. Um, we might ask you to, like, submit another request for funding because the description and the cost has changed. So um, as long as it is allowed by your line item as per the session law, you can change project in between, add scope, change scope, reduce scope, you know, whatever. Issues. So have more flexibility for these months. So that's one great thing. And this is part of the reason why we are advising that instead of breaking up your appropriation to multiple projects and submitting multiple requests for funding, mm -hmm. if you can group all of your drinking water projects into one bigger project, that way you've got that flexibility. So that way if you're saying, well, I'm, I was planning to do meter replacements for 100,000 and a, a water line extension for a million, but really now I need 200,000 for for water meters, and I'll take the hundred thousand out of the, the line extension. If it's one project, you, it's much easier to administer. It's for you and for us, um, as opposed to breaking things up and then having to resubmit the documents to show all of these changes. For the second part of the question, yes, since the environmental review is not required for this project, you can change the location. So. If you think um, you have to work on a different part of the town to change the water lines or sewer lines, yes, you can change that uh, later. All right, if ARPA funded projects listed in session law 2021 180, which was um, the, the first uh, appropriations act that included ARPA, if the ARPA funded projects come in under the designated allocation, can those funds be redirected to other projects? Uh, if the ARPA fund, so session law 2021-180 had direct appropriations. 
And those direct everybody who had direct appropriations already requested those funds and have identified what the projects are going to be. Um, so the funds should be moved, should be, should be used for those projects. Uh, there's some there was some competitive funding, you know, funds that were made available in session law 2021-180 that was made available through the application process. And local governments and other utilities apply for the funds and receive the funds for a specific project. The funds for that specific project is for that specific project. Now we may allow uh, more of the same project, but to, to if you come in under budget and you don't use all the funds that have been awarded through the competitive process, um, then uh, you can't change the scope. You can't use the funds for something completely different. Uh, it's funded for the project that was awarded. With the direct appropriations, you have a little bit more flexibility. Um, having said that, I'd be really surprised if you see a lot of projects come in under budget with um, with the cost these days. Could be. Um, yes. So if you your project comes under budget, that if it's an EMR project, like you know, if you, that money is like you know directly allocated to you, it didn't come through our competitive cycle. At that point, you can definitely add more scope to the project with the change order. Um, but we cannot change the obligation, so we cannot, you know, uh, that thing. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, with ARPA funds, that's an important piece too. With the ARPA funds, again, not this new session law, but with the ARPA funds, um, we cannot change the project after December 2024. Uh, that's, again, a federal obligation deadline that we're all meeting. Uh, so whatever has been determined as the project by December 2024, that's locked in. We can't really, we can't change that and change what the ARPA funds will be used for after that date. But if the change order is directly related, I'm not sure if it's directly related for the successful completion, we have to check on that. Yeah, we'd, we'd have to work with you to tell you what is allowable and what's not allowable. Now, session law 2023, 134, more flexible because it's not ARPA. Um, so we can work with you on, you know, if you're coming in under, what what are your options? You might have more options than you would under ARPA. Uh, will the responses to the questions be posted online? Or will the recording is being posted online? Um, but we will, uh, I'm looking at Kathy, we're, we're going to try to post, uh, post information on the webpage. So keep checking the webpage for information. Uh, we'll try to provide because it's not just a webinar, we get questions elsewhere as well. We'll try to make our webpage uh, resourceful for, for you all. All right, we have one particular, one question about a particular project. So a project, uh, it's a Hurricane Florence recovery work, a wood parking plant and early on construction. Uh, the funding is intended to reimburse project costs not covered by other sources like FEMA. Can we submit prior can we submit prior to prior paid contractor invoices to request reimbursement? Uh, if I understand you, you, you want to take that? Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's we'll try it then. Okay. So this one is like if if that invoice is not paid by the other agency, we can pay it. But if it's like already showing it's paid. We cannot, but I'm thinking you're saying that you have submitted the entire invoice to the other agency. Certain line items were like removed from that, and then you didn't get paid for that. So you wanted to use our session law forms to uh, do that. In that case, yes, but again, we have to start from the plans and specs review and determine eligibility. We cannot just come and say the project is under construction and just send us the invoice and give you the money. We cannot do that. We have to see the plans and specifications for the project and the big documents and everything. Which you will already have. If you're under construction, you should have all those. So you just submit those to us and we'll make sure that they're eligible. So the um but you can't double dip. You can't you, if you've gotten funding from FEMA or from some other source to pay for that particular invoice, you cannot use these session law funds to pay for the same invoice. Uh, but if you paid out of it, out of your own uh, enterprise funds uh, to cover the contract costs and try to reimburse yourself, again, as long as it's an eligible expense under everything we just talked about in this presentation and it's part of the plans and specs, um, then yes, you can pay, you can pay yourself back for those costs that you paid the contractors for an eligible expense for an eligible project. We might ask you some additional information showing that you know you haven't got 
paid by the other agencies. So that's, you know, you just have to work with us on that. We might have like a few more questions than our regular process. So. Oh, you have a hand raise. Oh, we have a hand raise. Uh, I don't know if you can actually unmute yourself. Let me see if I can see who it is. Yeah. Should we wrap up Kabita? Right. Travis. I'm scrolling down to get to the T's. It's Travis Hooley from right. Senator Jan Blue's office. Can you unmute Travis, please? Um, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, now we do. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, this is Travis Hewling. I'm calling from uh, Senator Dan Blue's office. I know that um, you did say that the slide would be available online. Yes, sir. Is there a direct link? I was looking, scrolling it's, through. It's in there and I'll provide it again. It's in the chat and it will be provided again in the chat in, in a minute. Okay. All right. Thank yes. you. I was just following up on that. Thank you very much. No problem. Yeah, it will be posted on, so for everybody else, if you join us late, um, if you go to DEQ's website, deq.nc.gov, and you go to the divisions area, click on water infrastructure, and you scroll okay. down to, um, let me try to go back to the, web, to the page that had the information. Um, if you scroll down to through our, our divisions website, you'll find a box that looks like this that says 2023 Appropriations Act Directed Projects. That's where you'll see um, this recording. And I know that Kathy has just posted um, the direct link to that web page. Uh, the QR code as well will take you straight to that web page as well. So yeah, the presentation will be posted as well as the recording. I'm hoping that the recording uh, quality will be good enough that we can post it. So that's the um, only caveat. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Any any questions? Did we have more questions? Like, so if anyone has questions, uh, you know, can raise your hand and we can have a minute. Yeah, we're here until 2.30. So if you have any questions, please uh, submit them in the chat. We just got one. Will you post the additional question? Will you post additional questions that may follow up, that may follow after the presentation um, on the same webpage? So again, we'll use that webpage as a way for us to communicate information that we think is helpful for multiple. So if we get a question after this presentation, let's say a week from now, that's a, a question that we think, you know what, that really applies to a lot of people and it might be helpful for everybody to see. We plan to use this webpage to provide, it's sort of like an FAQ area. We don't have that quite yet, but we're, we're gonna be working towards that. Um, so keep checking the webpage for additional information, additional resources. Um, but of course, if you have a specific question about a specific project, you can always reach out to, um, to our staff here, um, again, either Mikhail for the request for funding form, Kavitha for questions about projects, um, Kathy for PIO type, and we can follow up with you directly. Any questions? If somebody has a question that you want to you know, say out loud, you can always raise your hand and we will unmute you as well. Uh, we'll be monitoring for that. Not seeing any hands or any questions. All right, so just as a reminder, just to fill in the, the time while, while people might think of a question, um, next steps, of course, is to, the first step is to complete a request for funding form. If you have not yet received it, or if you think that you're the person that should receive it for your local government um, and have not received it, you can always reach out to us. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get to Mikkel's contact information. Um, reach out to Mikkel uh, for that request for funding form. Again, we, we, we've received 61 local governments requests, so that's great. Um, and then if you have questions about eligibilities, uh, reach out to um, our staff here, oops, our staff um, listed here under the funding questions. They can help you determine eligibility. Highly recommend local governments are designated as distressed to reach out to the Bible Utilities Projects Unit. Uh, if you're 
if you don't already have a project um, plan for the for the session law, uh, reach out to Kristen and our team will work with you to try to make the funds be basically like the viable utilities reserve. Um, so we have limited viable utilities reserve grant funds available. This is a great opportunity to use the appropriations to supplement uh, whatever you might have there, or if you don't have any DUR funds, to do the viability type projects um, to get your system um, up to speed as well. And to give you an update, we have been receiving um, requests for funding from you know some of you, and we have been processing that and sending you a letter of intent to fund. Um, so at this point, if you are in a hurry to start the projects, I would recommend start the engineering procurement, start the design, start you know start submitting to us like plans and specs. Um, don't wait for the funding offer, but somehow if you are in a hurry for funding offer too, just just let us know. We are still waiting on you know formalizing the the funding offer template and also the conditions that go along with it. So we haven't started sending the funding offers yet, um, and, but definitely you don't need that to start your project. So please go ahead and and start the work. Um. Another thing that we're also asking for when you're submitting those requests for funding, some of a few of the local governments said that that the projects are nearly starting construction, or you're about to go to bid, or you have gone to bid, or you're adding money to an existing pro construction project. It's helpful information for our division to know if you're that, at that stage of a project, because then we we know that you're you're seeking disbursements pretty quickly, or you, you need to know what the funding you need that funding offer soon so that it, it becomes part of your bid package and what you can uh, communicate uh, is available. Uh, so when you're submitting that request for a funding form on the website, that you're, the portal that you're submitting that, there's actually a question that says, that's asking for the status of whether or not you're close to bids or have gone to bid or not yet, you're still in the planning and design stage. Uh, it's, it doesn't, I mean, it's, it's an indi it's a, it's a indicator for us at the division so that we can try to process uh, and make sure that we're communicating with you if there's some kind of urgency um, to receiving the, the communications from us. There's a question. Um, where can I find Appendix A? Um, I'll, I'll answer this one first and come back to it. Sorry, I missed one. But uh, the, the last question that was submitted is where can I find Appendix A you mentioned earlier? Can you post the link? Appendix A is part of the request for funding form. Um, so whoever received it from the local government, if you scroll past the actual form itself, there's an Appendix A. Um, that's in the form. I think also our website has similar information. It might not have exactly what Appendix A shows, right. but it has similar information to what's in Appendix A. It has a whole list of all the appropriations and how, and I think it's the local government. Does it also show the amount of funding or just the local government? We'll we'll come back to you on that and, and, and verify. But Appendix A is part of the request for funding form. Uh, early question is how long does it take to obtain a letter of intent to fund after the application? So not an application, it's a request for funding, but after the request for funding has been submitted, how soon can you expect a letter of intent to fund? Um, it depends on how, like if the uh, letter the request for funding is pretty clear, it's for a project that is eligible. That there's no there's no questions about it. Um, we'll process them more quickly. Sometimes the request for funding that we get has incomplete information or the, the, the project description is not sufficient to be able to help us determine whether or not it meets all the eligibility requirements under 159G. So we'll have to reach back out and, and ask for additional questions or ask for a revision to request for funding form just to get that additional information that might be missing. So that would delay. But once we get a, a let's call it a clean request for funding that's pretty simple to process, um, it's not going to be days at the moment because we're also handling ARPA projects and we're handling uh, existing projects and it's the same staff doing all of this. Um, so it may be a few weeks. I'm, not, I'm looking at the staff to see because you all are preparing these. Yes, um, right now the process is already set up. So we are moving faster than before. So if you have something like a two months ago maybe like a month ago it must be a little bit slower but now we have our process already set up so it should get it like sooner um maybe like about 30 to 45 days is the max that we can um you can expect but you know again if this is an emergency like you want it right now you have a board meeting you want to show this you know whatever the reason is if it's like a really time um, pressing you can contact us and we can try to make it like you know expedited otherwise 
ARPA projects should be our priority and everybody else's priority basically at this point. So um, yeah, we are getting the LOIFs out now sooner um, since the process is already set up for it. Again, if you have any more questions, please raise raise your hands or pose it in the in the chat. And I'm looking around the room as well for our staff here. If there's anything that you think we need to communicate. Um, Anything add anything else to add? Um, thank you. If you, if you are leaving, we, we appreciate your time um, for attending. And if you have any additional follow up questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, but I'm looking to see if our, any of our staff here have any additional thoughts or anything that you wanted to add. Um, Mikkel, I know you're on. If there's anything about the request for funding forms that you want to say, um, here's a chance. Probably timeline, Mikkel. Do you have a better idea of, of timeline when? that we are getting our LOIFs out. And you might have to unmute. Yeah, we do. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks, thanks for the unmute. Um, I would say, like Kavitha mentioned, the previous ones, when you, if you submitted back in October, November, December, we are just starting to get ramped up on those. Uh, they are starting to get them out quicker. Um, again, also just want to reiterate, if it is a time crunch, just let us know. We can try and put that ahead in the queue. Uh, but right now, I would say probably we are starting to catch up on those backlogged ones. Um, and we are just now starting to maybe to get to some of the ones in January that got submitted at the beginning of the month. Uh, so it's probably looking about three weeks right now. Um, three to four weeks, I'd say, currently, and that should that should close as it's slowing down with the amount of requests for funding we're receiving in daily. Thank you, Miguel. And we still have 100 people. Okay, yeah, well, um, lots of you are, are still on. We appreciate it. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. I'm going to post the contact folks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kathy's, the RPIO Kathy is going to be posting in the chat. Um, some of the contact information that you see here. If you have, if you're thinking about any other questions, you can always email us. Uh, you know, we don't need to like. Well, have it here. <laughs> yeah, but this is a time if you can get all of us together here, right? Yeah. If you have follow-up questions, feel free, but we're we're here until 2.30, so we'll, we'll stick around if anybody wants to stick around and have any more questions. For those of you that, um, you know, uh, you've gotten your questions answered or uh, heard enough to know what, what the next steps are, um, again, thank you for your time. Um, we don't want to hold you uh, for, for longer unless you really want to, uh, but we're here until 2.30. We might mute ourselves until we see a question come in.
Thank all right. Thank you all for thank you all for attending. Um, I don't see any more questions or any hands up. So uh, we will adjourn this meeting. But again, if you have any follow up questions, please feel free to reach out to the vision. Um, and thank you again for your time.